Welcome once again, everybody, to Blockbuster Mentality, the show where celebrities come on to talk about their favorite films. I'm your host, Ben. Uh, The title of the episode, you know it. But first, subscribe to us on iTunes. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Rate and review us, please. It helps us out a lot. We've been climbing the charts. Please continue to rate, review us, listen to us every week. We'd really appreciate it. This week, I talk to the very talented Ben Bateman. You might know him from the movie Trivia Schmodown. He has an album coming out. Uh, His song, which you heard at the beginning of the show, definitely check that out. Sorry for tonight. Great song. Can't wait for the album to come out. We talk about that, so you'll learn more about that when it comes out. If you stick around for the episode, we talk 1994's Shawshank Redemption. Had a blast talking with him and, you know, breaking down one of the classics. So, hope you guys enjoy it. Here's my conversation with Ben Bateman. So, you said you were from uh, Seattle? Seattle, Washington, born and raised. Yeah, I moved to LA for the first time I moved to LA was in 2005. Um, I was 16. I graduated high school. I turned 17. I got a scholarship to this acting school and I moved out here by myself. And I did that for about nine months in 2005. And then I went back to Seattle. And in 2009, when I was 21, I came out here properly for good. And I've been here for 12 years now in August. Wow. And did you, the second time you came out, what, what did you come out for? (laughs) <laughs> uh I, acting modeling yeah. music the whole the whole the whole run of the mill thing that you do out here um and yeah it's been it's been a long it's been a long and winding road as tom petty would say um and uh i've done all kinds of stuff in the last 12 years slowly but surely sort of accumulating little notches on the belt to finally kind of get to the existence that i live now which is <laughs> some <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, and I've, I've noticed you've you've definitely done a lot. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, uh, you know, someone who does that, who does music, who does acting, who does hosting, to content creation. Like, what do you, what do you, when you introduce yourself to someone, what do you say you do? <laughs> I gotta tell you, man, it's it's a really weird one. I don't I don't have a good I don't have a good version for it because it's usually this has happened a couple times when I've gone on dates. Um, <laughs> I like explain what I do. <laughs> But it's this list. So I have to check at a certain point where I'm like, you just think I'm lying. You probably just think I'm making this up because I've I've named like seven things. I'm like, you must think I'm bad at all of them or I'm just (laughs) full of it. Can I swear on the show or no? Can we swear? Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And and like, so I usually will say something to the effect of like, I'm I'm like an online content creator and a personality. And right. then I'm also the vice president of a toy company is what I, the, those are the, those are like the two things I will like usually just like say, wait, so uh, well, get into that. What you're a vice president of a <laughs> towing company. I didn't know this. Yeah. 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 My, uh, one of my best friends is a guy named Alex Kessler and he, um, started a company about five years ago called Kess. It's the largest or the largest hula hoop company in the world. Uh, his grandfather invented the hula hoop in, in the fifties. Um, wow. <laughs> and so we do a ton of business with you know Target and Walmart and, and all over the world. And um, he was my podcast co-host on the Magic the Gathering podcast I've been doing for the last six years. So wow. uh, when he started the company, I kind of was helping out in the beginning and then the company grew and took off. I became the vice president of sales and um, I'm still able to kind of do it simultaneously with all my creative stuff um yeah it still manages to work so yeah. that's the other thing that takes like, quite a bit of my time <laughs> so you sell hula hoops is essentially mm-hmm. you know what uh <laughs> you do. but saying you're a, a vice president of a toy company just sounds way better so that's definitely yes. yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> yes it does <laughs> no but that's easier. awesome man easier, i mean it's yeah. uh yeah it's it's definitely much easier than going down the rabbit hole. well you see you know you got uh this guy who invented hula hoops back in the 50s that's where right. it all began. i all try to it's, i try to i try to pick the pick my yeah. spots a, a, <laughs> a bit more when did you get into doing uh, blockbuster mentality like, when did you get into podcasting and, and just like being an on camera or on camera uh, or on mic person yeah i started in uh late 2015 um okay. I want to say, yeah, late 2015. Um, and yeah, we just kind of started doing just like movie news stuff, the typical thing. And then I just, you know, it, I just got burnt out from that. 
um, just because you had to be on top of it all the time, and it was just yep. like, all right, I, I, I can't do this, like, because I have a day job, and you know, got a, <laughs> got a balance that I have a family, I got kids, you know, so it's like I, you know, it, it just was too much. So I was just like, let me just get down to why, why I started this podcast in the first place, and that's you know, movies and let's break down a movie. And then it became, you know, me and my buddy just talking about it. And then I was like, let's get guests involved. And, you know, yeah, man, you know, kind of just, it evolves. It's crazy how much it, it, <laughs> it evolves like that. You know, it's, uh, um, you know, it, and I like it, you know, I like to continually evolve because, you know, you don't want to stay stagnant or anything. So, you know, yeah. Joke about, joke about your favorite movies. And yeah, I mean, yeah. and we get to talk, you sounds like you get to talk about great ones. You know, obviously tonight we're talking about Shawshank, which one of the greatest films of all time. So <laughs> yeah. then that, if it's in that caliber that it's like, it's always fun to talk about them. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's been, a, been a journey, been meeting awesome people since we've been doing a uh, guest driven show. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, can looking forward to seeing you know where it goes next but hey i'm interviewing you uh what uh <laughs> I, I actually discovered you from uh uh the schmodown um yep. you Blue know and actually i actually had a uh, opportunity to talk to christian harloff uh, on this show which was great because i i want to say he was you know one of the definitely a big inspiration for us even starting this but um uh but yeah yeah i i, I remember you from the schmodown or discovered you from the schmodown and uh i gotta say man you uh you're a great heel you're you're a great guy to <laughs> try to be i try to, i try to be i try to be despicable you know yeah yeah and i you know i'm I'm using a phrase which i because i've never been a wrestling guy or anything like i've never really followed it much and i i think i learned the term heel from the schmodown so <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean it's uh it, you know i've seen you in other places and obviously you're a nice guy and everything but uh, was it was it easy is it easier to play a villain would you say uh you know i i like doing it there was a season where i had this kind of little bit more like face character i was a little more in between and and i was okay at it i just when i'm in a match i tend to just default to it because it's my it's it's the thing i've done since i started and it's like how i play and uh, I, I don't have as much of an edge, I find, when I play the game if I'm not doing that stuff. I, it gives me a little bit more of a rhythm um, to stay like ahead of my opponent. And so that's I find that easier. It's not the best, like, I know all these people. They're all people that I've worked with. They're from friendly with some I'm close right. friends with. And so it's there's a weird, incestuous kind of thing where, like, I am a person and I have, like, you know, thick skin some days, less, some other days, less. And like, I have projects that I work on that I'm not trying to be a bad guy. I don't want you to boo me when I play music. You right. know? Like I, so like, and that's a weird, that's a weird balance that I think you just have to accept when you're part of something like this, that some people are just going to think the, the most common comment I get from people is I, I just thought you were such a prick. I'm surprised <laughs> I didn't really, you know, like, and I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, that means I'm doing my job. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, yeah, it almost is a compliment at that point because it's like, oh, obviously, you know, I was I was playing it off pretty well. So, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's all all kudos and yeah, definitely. I mean, I know you've you you you've been a schmodown champion. Is that correct? I yeah yeah I won at the end of 2019. <laughs> I won that title. It was it was, awesome. it was a great uh, great season. Good for you, man. And now, yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's keeps growing. I see. Yeah, I mean, he's had Kevin Smith on there, and yeah. he's getting uh, you know uh, other. Yeah, Jericho was on there and everything. So yeah, yeah there's a lot of people for, now. It's awesome that you're a part of that. Um, now, uh, obviously, your latest thing has been music. Seems yeah. like you're uh yeah, trying to get uh well, you know, you did a live concert I saw and everything, which is great. Uh let's get into that a little bit. What's uh how long have you been planning this album? Have you done an album before? Let let the fans know what uh what your music uh journey has been. Yeah, when I was 12 years old, I started playing in bands like in middle school. You know, we were like, we, I was in a band called the Decepticons for a little while. And then <laughs> nice. I was in another band called Last Action Hero when I was like, uh, like right, 14. My older brother got me into hair metal as kind of a joke. He thought he was kidding, but I, he's my older brother. I'm obsessed with him. So right. he was telling me about Poison and Bon Jovi and Crew and Leopard, all these bands and, and how sweet they were. And I like 
took, he loves them, but he was like talking about how badass they were. So I like decided that that was going to be my identity. So I got really tall. I grew 10 inches or something like that one year when I was in high school. Um, yeah. And I grew my hair out. I got like a white leather jacket, like Axel in the Paradise City video and started taking singing <laughs> lessons. And like, so all through high school, I was like really doing this thing, trying to be like this really aggressive singer. And um, I chased music as part of my career for quite a few years, but I never like, went for it really there was one period where i had a band and we had an ep we put out in 2009 but um the, over the last 10 years mostly it's been for fun um that last time that i really kind of was going for it was almost 10 years ago so this thing was just i had you know written music all my life and I, pandemic had started and i was just starting to feel kind of inspired and like I was really kind of missing it and uh i went through you know a big transition in my life and i just I could feel that these songs were starting to kind of take shape a little more naturally. And they, and I was noticing that like, I got older, like that high stuff that I wanted to do when I was a kid, I still could do, but it was a little more natural to sing like, like lower, like my actual voice. Right. And that was yeah. so much more comfortable to be able to write songs that way. It just was very appealing to me. And so I started doing it and I, I launched this YouTube channel called nerds and suits and I was doing a show on there called uh, song from the scene for a while where I, break down a, a great song and a great movie. And I talk about the scene itself, you know, like time after time in, in, uh, in, uh, Romy Michelle yeah. or, you know, there's so many good ones. And, uh, yeah. and then I played the song and I was really enjoying it and the response was very warm. And so I just decided, you know, about 10 months ago that I was going to write and record this album. I was going to enlist the help of my childhood best friend, who's a producer out here in LA and hire him properly uh, yeah. to, write and record this album and release it. And then I decided now I decided I'm going to tour on it in August. I'm going to go do a 10 show tour and I'm just kind of rolling up my sleeves and just doing it all myself. I, you know, it's just me and a guitar. There's not really, <laughs> there's not really a plan otherwise, but the yeah. response has been very warm. I put the first song out and people have, uh, have been really supportive of it, which is awesome. Uh, yeah, that's, it is awesome. And yeah, you got that uh, single out, uh, sorry for tonight, yep. uh, which yeah, you can hear on Spotify on, uh, Apple music pr pretty yep. much everywhere. Right. Correct. Yeah, it's all yeah. over. There's a lyric. There's a ly lyric video on YouTube, and uh, and yeah, and like like I said, you, I played a show that was a lot of fun, and so uh, yeah, it's been. If, if I mean, if anybody listening to this has, has checked it out or is gonna check it out, I promise you, uh, I know how much of a pain in the ass it is to go listen to somebody's art who you know from <laughs> not doing something artistic. And uh, yeah. if you check it out, I really appreciate it. It has meant a lot to people that have supported so far. Definitely. Yeah, I'm here in uh, Tampa. I see you have a Orlando show planned so I'm, I'm yeah i'm hoping is that are you uh, are you florida yeah 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 unfortunately um yeah i'm uh yeah in florida here uh from detroit originally but uh um yeah uh, orlando is about an hour and a half drive away so we'll see we'll see i'll try to make okay. it if not you know you, you can understand why it's an hour and a half away come on you got you uh, got a family you got kids i get it exactly <laughs> <laughs> exactly now i you know before we get into the movie here obviously uh, you know i know uh influences you know music wise i know i saw you talk about brand new one time on your yeah. uh, twitter uh which i oh, love uh it seems like uh we might have a similar taste in music which is cool uh, do you have specific uh, influences for your music yeah, you know, it's funny. I There's a period of my life, like an emo period of my life in high school <laughs> that I still really connect to a lot of that music. Um, yeah. I would say, I think from a pure songwriting perspective and a singer, anybody who is my age, I'm 32, and is an acoustic guitar player and tells you that they weren't influenced by Chris Caraba and Dashboard Confessional <laughs> is just lying. They're just lying. It's, oh, he's, he's, the yeah. he's like the most influential songwriter of his time for just like acoustic guitar music. It's like him and probably Dave Matthews, but he's honestly the generation before that. So, um, yep. you know, like I think there's, I don't, I don't take as much songwriting influence from Chris because I, I don't find that I like to write songs that way as much, but right. in terms of pure performance, and the way I sing so much of it is him. I think, I mean, Tom Petty's my favorite artist of all time. So I, there's a lot of Tom Petty. And, and when I think about constructing a song, um, the Goo Goo Dolls are one of my favorite bands. They they had so like I as a songwriter, I think Resnick is such a good pop songwriter. And then yeah, there's a ton of other people. Oh, you know that yeah. I, that I'm a huge fan of. 
I'm a big Taylor Swift fan, honestly. I've really started to embrace what she does. I think she's yeah. just an incredible songwriter and and really so yeah, I mean those are kind of some of the places probably. I, I've I've belted out Taylor Swift in my day, but uh speaking of belting out, I I uh, just dashboard and Chris Caraba uh reminds me of me and my sister Chelsea, my cousin Aaron driving up North Michigan, just belting out uh that album uh Yeah, man. Uh uh places you've come to fear the most and uh Such yeah, just album. uh it's uh yeah it's <laughs> yeah like you said anyone who's been through that emo phase you know is is and uh has gone through that yeah they're they're lying if they say they you know didn't uh didn't feel anything from dashboard come on you i know? mean it's fun many, to make fun so many, of but <laughs> there, well, there's so many good moments in, in those first two dashboard records i, I just got a, a record player i bought a vinyl and uh got a surround sound system for my apartment. And one of the records I ordered was Swiss army romance because yep. it just was one of those albums that like, when I go back and listen to the whole complete works, it's just, it just has so many things I, I, I go back to, but you mentioned places you come for the most. And I'll always remember that the big, the big part at the end is you can't <laughs> think it hard enough to please. Right. Like yep. it's just the, the, those, those moments. And, and also I think about brand new and um, a lot of the screaming that comes on, I was never as big a fan of the first day De- of Dejan Tendu. I know people love that album. That's the one everybody thinks is yeah. the best. But I always really love the second one, uh, Devil and God are Raging Inside Me. I guess it's the third one, but the one with the one with Jesus Christ on it. That's always yeah, yeah, been the yeah. one that I I love that record. That's that's yeah. the like brand new record that I connected. That screaming stuff's a lot of fun. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, their first album was you know more poppy. Their second album was you know they got more mature and everything. And then yeah, that third album was like hey, man, they're talking about deep shit there. <laughs> you know, they're yeah, dude, they're really going for it there. But uh, no, that's awesome, man. Um, but uh, but yeah, let's. Uh, so <laughs> when I you know, ask uh, guests, you know, what movie they want to talk about. Sometimes I have to send them a list. You sent me a list and, um, you know, it's, uh, it was hard to choose from. You sent me basically a list of your favorite movies. Yeah. Um, and I thought, you know what? It's, I, I think it's time to do Shawshank because I've, I've kind of stayed away from, you know, doing like the Godfathers and, sure. you know, the, you know, just those classics and, you know, Shawshank, I would loop in there too. It's just like, you know, I've, oh, I've, yeah. but, but when I, you know, messaged you back, I was just like, you know, what? it's time. Let's, let's, let's do Shawshank. Let's, let's do one of those, uh, you know, movies that just are, you know, a part of, you know, or just a part of the history of cinema and just will always be. Um, and I usually ask the guest, why did you pick this movie? Um, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's kind of obvious, but why did you pick this movie, Ben? So I'm a big list guy and the list yeah. I sent you is loosely, I think I sent you 12 or 13 movies. And I, mm-hmm. a few years ago, I, I came up with my top 50 movies of all time. This was like 2017, I think is when I did it. I remember Logan had just come out and I was unwilling to put it on the list because I felt movies had to last a whole year before I could put them on. Yeah. Um, and so I made this list and I wrote it on my computer and I had it on like a notes file. And then that computer got stolen out of my car and I never, I guess I didn't save the list anywhere else. It didn't like back up. I've ne- so I, that list is gone. And I spent two months like perfecting it. And so I try to remember the whole list and I just don't, but I've mostly <laughs> reconstructed my top 10 or 15 favorites or so. Yeah. And I try to be like honest with myself. And, and like when I think about a movie or I talk about a movie, like, endlessly and because it, it happens in a kind of innocuous way i don't know if you know what i'm talking about but like when a movie starts to enter your mind as one of your favorites you mm-hmm. find yourself talking about it and referencing it a lot in like a i really like that movie kind of way and then all of a sudden you realize one day wait i think that's just one of my 10 favorites ever right. i don't think there's how is it not <laughs> you know the most recent inclusion was infinity war i realized finally that like I'd watched Infinity War like 15 times. It was my favorite MCU movie. I knew like every line. I love talking about it the most. And I was like, okay, it qualifies. I, I, this movie is this this movie is okay to put on my list now. And Shawshank's been on that. It's been in the category for such a long time. And it's never fallen out. Because the thing about Shawshank, and we're going to get into this, I'm sure, is that when you turn that movie on, it is a masterclass screenplay. The, yeah. it, it is so good, so fast. And it made me realize watching it this time, how there are just certain types of scenes in movies that I, I realize now are shaped from this movie in my mind. They'll never be like a scene in a movie that does it the same way or like shaped my concept of a scene like that as much as Shawshank Redemption. 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's mesmerizing. It's, you know, it just draws you in right away. And it's, first of all, it's on TV all the time. Uh, you know, it's, I think, uh, Ted Turner actually owns it. So like he, and he owns TNT. So it's on TNT all the time. (laughs) Yeah. Um, you know, so you, you, if it's ever on, yeah, you're just, you're just sucked in right away. But, uh, but yeah, I like what you say about, you know, kind of, having a criteria for your list being out for a year that makes sense to me i like that you know that's a good a good criteria to have um but uh be for me yeah to be honest with my list i think it's all about uh you know let me pick it because it's my favorite not because oh yep. this is you know what everyone else says should be in the top 10 like you know like citizen kane like I, I've, that's never connected with me so no, I'm not going to say it's my favorite movie of all time. It's not, you know, it, you know, it just isn't. Right. It's not going to be on a well, list of mine. Sorry. It didn't connect the with difference, me. <laughs> the difference between favorite and greatest is, an, is right. a distinction as a, as, a, as a contemporary sort of critic or talking head on things like this. So you're talking about, it could be you're talking about fast food chains. You could be talking right. about music. You could be talking about whatever it is. Your favorite is very different. I mean, you, you'll notice behind me, I've got a collage of, of the greatest main of all time, Patrick Swayze. And, um, so I've got Young Blood up here from '86, the, uh, the the hockey movie. I got oh, Portu- I got Portuguese Roadhouse here, and I got uh, <laughs> North and South, the uh, which is the Civil War TV miniseries that he did before he was really famous. <laughs> and uh, I love Swayze; he's my guy. He's he's yeah. been my all time guy for such a long time. But it, there's no doubt that if you're asking me like who is the greatest actor, it's not Patrick Swayze. Who's my favorite actor? He's top one or two. Right. And like I can recognize like Dirty Dancing is in my 10 favorite movies, I think, or 12. I, I can't remember if I put it on the list, but it's not the best. I just right. love Dirty Dancing more than anything. So like I'm going to talk about that movie. I'm not going to talk about The Last Emperor or some other movie that came sure. out the same year. Yeah, well, it's funny because, yeah, you put uh, Tommy Boy uh, was one of the <laughs> ones you put. And I freaking love Tommy Boy. Like that's, yeah. you know, it's is it one of the greatest movies of all time no is it one of my favorites <laughs> yes you Debatably, know? maybe one of the greatest yeah, well, I mean. <laughs> well you know <laughs> we'll we'll leave that up for you know we'll leave that in the air for twitter to to nail us um <laughs> but uh but yeah you're right i mean it's it's all about yeah being favorite but you know the, shawshank is one of the I don't know, few. I don't know. It's one of the lots of movies that <laughs> can be your favorite and also just be freaking outstanding. I mean, it's right. uh, you know, it's got so many great uh, themes. Uh, so yeah, I mean, let's kind of dive into this a little bit. Uh, so I love how the it, it kind of starts. Uh, well, obviously with the the courtroom scene, but when they get into the prison, the guys are kind of easygoing. You know, Red is doing his parole thing yes you know i'm i'm rehabilitated yes yes and then he yep. gets out to his friends and you know they're like oh how'd it go he's like oh same as always you know and they're like ah you know well i'm up for my you know rejection hearing next next yeah. week you know they're it's kind of just like hopeless kind of easy going and it's just kind of you know it's just like okay this is a prison movie let's get into it and this is how it is you know right. um yeah the movie has so it does a couple things, I think, exceptionally well. Like, there's a few things that this movie does. So I was thinking about this, like, as a courtroom scene, the two to three minutes you get from that prosecutor are so seared into my brain in terms of yeah. the way that you would imagine a prosecutor going after a guy in a courtroom would be. That All, all that stuff that he says, where he's like, um, I, I want you to think about this for a minute. There are six bullets in a revolver, right? And he, has, he does the thing, four bullets per lever, which means that he, you know, f- and refilled, like that whole thing that he gives, that whole speech, you're just like, this is what it's like in a courtroom when somebody's right. going after you. As a kid, I don't think I realized how much that scene stuck with me as just the quintessential courtroom scene. You don't realize immediately when Red starts doing, there must be a guy like me in every prison. That's the voiceover. If you're a kid and you watch that, it is the ultimate all-time voiceover in a movie. Better than any other voiceover ever in the history of movies is Morgan Freeman as Red in The Shawshank Redemption. Yeah. Like, it's what it's supposed yeah. to sound like. It's the gold standard. Yeah. It's just, yeah, it's so, yeah, it's, uh, well, it's funny because, um, 
I guess Darabont, the director of the film, he uh, yeah. he he watched uh, Goodfellas. I read that he watched Goodfellas every Sunday of production, and uh, he took inspiration from that because that has a voiceover Ray, Ray Liotta, obviously incredible. Yeah, um, yeah and uh, so yeah, he took inspiration from that. But then you, you go from Ray Ray Liotta, which you know was great. You know, it was you know good narrator and everything. But you, then you go to Morgan Freeman. You know, you go to that yeah. voice. That's where 1994. That's where the more Morgan Freeman, you know, cr- narration started. The Morgan Freeman, uh, I don't want to say caricature because I don't, I don't want to, call, I don't want to deduce him to that. But <laughs> that's where it began, you know, is Shawshank. When you think of Mor- Morgan Freeman as a narrator, you got you, it. All starts at Shawshank, and which is just great. Um, yeah, yeah, agreed. He, he, yeah. he, I mean, and again, he like. He captures your attention pretty fast. You know, you're, you're curious who he is in the prison. Like there, there's just every, the reason I mentioned the script is I think that it does something uh, that I think every script wants to be able to do, which is that every single sort of little setup moment, they all feel like they have a, a reasonable payoff and they, they, none of them feel like that scene in the movie that you're watching where you're like, Oh, this is like, this is the six minutes of the movie that's like, yeah, I mean, like, I don't really need this as a viewer. I understand why you justified this when you were putting it together. But now that all is said and done, like, I don't need this six minutes, right? Like, right. Warrior's my favorite movie of all time. And there's, like, a couple scenes in Warrior where I'm like, the stuff on the army base, with, I don't know how well you know Warrior, but, like, there's just a few scenes in the movie. And it's my literal favorite movie ever made. But there are a few scenes where I'm like, yeah, this is just kind of a weaker scene. Like, you, you guys probably could have cut this or, like, this just right. isn't that good, you know? Yeah, no, yeah, and yeah, it, you know, there's no like filler in this movie. Like, there's no, you know, everything serves a purpose, you know, it's it, and it's great. And so, are you talking about Warrior, the, the MMA movie? Yeah, it's my yeah, literal okay. number one favorite movie I've ever made. Uh, Tom Hardy, Joel Edgerton, it's the, yeah, it, it is, it is the I, that's my single most rewatchable movie I've ever watched. Are you a big I, MMA I, guy or? No, no, I don't really particularly wow. care about MMA. I didn't even, and I thought the movie was like, I thought that movie was going to be like a guilty pleasure kind of deal when I first watched it. And it was exactly what I was talking about with Infinity War over the years, where slowly but surely, as I watched it more and more times, yeah. and, and I, I had a lucky experience where I got to just by chance uh, met the screenwriter, and then he introduced me to the director and the cast. And so for a few years there, I was sort of like, in the little world of Gavin O'Connor and like just yeah. hanging out with those guys and going to events with them and stuff and um, getting to meet Joel and, and everything and Tom. Yeah. And it was, it was just awesome. It was really cool. And, and then I realized slowly but surely over the years, like that movie was catching on more and more and more. And now right. when people talk about that movie, they don't talk about it as like, uh, Oh, it's like this above average MMA movie. Like people do actually talk about that movie. Like it's one of the great sports dramas of all time. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I, I've got to be honest. I've I've seen it the one time when it first came out. I enjoyed it, um, but now, I, yeah, now you're making me want to revisit it because, yeah, I mean that's uh, that's awesome. You know, I love when you know people bring up a movie that I saw a long time ago. Like I keep meaning to uh, check out Benjamin Button again because someone had told yeah. me that that was their number one favorite movie. That's I know that's how that's I feel. A, that, that's a crazy number one pick. I know that's that's how I feel too, but. <laughs> You know, when people bring up a case and are passionate about it, it's like, hey, hey you know, maybe I'll it. give yeah. it a chance again. But uh, I'm gonna have to give Warrior a chance again. So, not oh, that yeah. I didn't like it, I just, you know, I wouldn't yeah. wouldn't resonate with me as a number one. But that's you. I love it. You know, exactly. Stick exactly. with your guns. Um, but yeah, Shawshank. So yeah, I mean, like I said, with the easygoing stuff, it gets real, real fast. Shit gets real, real fast because you know they take bets about. You know who's gonna who's gonna break first, which you, we don't really know what they're taking bets about. You know when yeah. it first starts. Obviously, we do because we've seen it hundreds hundreds of times. But you know when you're initially seeing this, you don't know what they're taking bets about. But it's basically who which prisoner is gonna you know take their uh, is gonna break down first, is gonna cry right. and everything. And they take the fatty and uh, the great Clancy Brown plays Captain H- uh, Hadley, and uh, he comes in basically shuts everybody up um and uh, because that's right after i wanted to mention the sound design uh because the when when they all say lights out at that first scene when the prisoners are like taunting them and you hear like noises coming from everywhere it's just like so haunting like it's like wow this is my first night in prison and i'm hearing you know, these crazy people who have committed these heinous crimes, like yelling this shit like that is 
what nightmares are made of. <laughs> yeah, the sound design you mentioned is really important and they do a great job with. It's also the Thomas Newman score is just amazing and and the Shawshank yes. theme itself, which is one of my favorites of all time. Uh, when you get that overhead helicopter shot of the prison as it sets up, the, it, it just... There's this ominous feeling of like yep. I don't know I don't know exactly how to describe it, but it's almost like a it's almost like the sinister comfortability because the stakes of the film are very high. Obviously, you mentioned Captain Hadley kills this guy for just yeah. crying, like that's what happens. And and the sisters, which we'll get into, like there's things in this movie that are very dark. And it, you, you imagine if you were actually in the situation, it would not feel like hanging with your friends every day, which is what this movie kind of feels like a lot of the time. It's best friends hanging out together. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. it's done so well. The stakes are set up, but then you're also coaxed into a sense of security, which you, they're putting you in the position of these characters, which is like that they it's day to day. You know, it's not always terrifying. And these guys kind of run the show. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's uh, it, it's yeah, it's just it, and it's crazy because, yeah, I mean, you 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 have, you know, Red's character who swears that uh, Dufresne is going to break and yet he didn't make a peep the entire night. You know, it's just like, what yeah. is it about this guy? What is it about Andy Dufresne that, you know, has Red so intrigued? Um, and it's, uh, you know, it seems like it's just his, his calm demeanor, maybe, you know, just, you know, he's just this. You know, I, and I don't want to say wimpy looking guy, but yeah, kind of right. a wimpy looking guy, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, Tim Tim Robbins plays Andy Dufresne uh, perfectly. Um, you have that William Sadler plays Haywood. Uh, who else we got here? Uh, got a lot of character actors, like you oh, were talking yeah. about the uh, the um, uh, attorney earlier, Jeffrey uh, uh, Demun. I okay, believe yeah, his name I'm is, sure. but yeah, he's been in a bunch of things. He's a great character actor. I, I think there's the, you, you get the Thomas Newman sweep and then you have the red voiceover where he's like, you know, what he says, like, I could see why some of the boys took him for snobby. And he's, he has that whole monologue where he says he had a quiet way about him. Yeah. Um, you know, like, <laughs> like, like, like a man walking in a park without a worry or a care in the world, I think is the line. Um, and yeah, you you get you get set up really nicely very early on the, the juxtaposition of these two characters, the way they handle themselves. But it's like the ultimate movie bromance so quickly because there's like this ultimate mutual understanding between these two guys. And again, the stakes are very high. Like the horrible things are happening to Andy, and you know, like it's. But it, I don't know how to describe it. There's a comfort <laughs> yeah. in there. There's just a comfort in the movie that happens quite early on that I think yeah. is pretty unique and hard to achieve in a prison film. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, especially in a prison film. And I love I love how you bring up bromance. It is. I mean, it it is a bromance between Red and Red and Andy. I mean, they're totally. you know, essentially, you know, uh, Andy uh, first approaches Red because he wants um a hammer, uh, a rock hammer. Right. And, you know, because Red's the guy that, that knows how to get things. How to get I, things, yeah. I, yeah, I've been known to get things from time to time. <laughs> um, we're going to do our terrible Morgan Freeman impressions uh, today. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> uh, so do you think what he's, what he's asking for the uh, rock hammer the first time, do you think he has any inkling to escape at that point? No, I mean, the again, the payoff at the end when they start to cut back to the old scenes is really great. And especially the way that they cut away from him carving his name into the wall there is so, so great. Um, I think that when he gets the rock hammer, he hadn't been around for very long. And right. he, you know, I think, I think humans are very adaptable. It's one of the things that if this pandemic has shown us anything as a world, it's that like, we didn't see this coming. We didn't think that right. this was going to be life for the last year. And it just happened like that. All of a yeah. sudden, it was just, here we are. We're still in it. Like, everything changed. All of our lives, the way we're living, totally changed on a dime. So you think about him in the situation that he's in. He's, you know, he's framed, sort of framed, but he's set up wrongfully for this murder. And he's in court, and they say, you know, two life sentences. And you can see the look on his face. He is, how did this happen? Right. So I think by the time he gets to that situation in the movie um, with the uh, with the the rock hammer, I think that's sort of a, I'm going to make the best of it while I'm here moment. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think he's. I don't think he's thinking of tunneling under a wall or escaping yet. I I think he's truly like, just being a human. He's just being adaptable. This is where I am. So if you know if I'm going to be here, then I'd like to do something I recognize, kind of a thing. Right. 
exactly. And yeah, I love the juxtaposition with the pandemic and everything. Like, yeah, we have to we have to get used to our new normal. You know, we have to get used to talking to our friends over Zoom and and doing these shows over Zoom. Like, right. you know, it's uh, it's crazy just how quick your your world can change. You know, not to you know compare us to going to prison for something we didn't do, but uh, but you know, it's uh, it's you know we we can relate in some sense now Um, i also think there's a setup too of you know this is this is the classic bird to right to be caged story it's been told a lot of times and and i think the most famous version of this story probably other than this is cool hand luke is probably the one that's like that's like the biggest comp i think you would say um and it's a little different though because he's such a chaotic character luke is and he's and that movie is so much darker in a different way um, that movie's like yeah. really sad and just, and it ends, it's just a really sad ending as well. Um, but he, his whole bit in that movie is to sort of nothing is going to ever keep him down. And he's always going to have a, you know, just like have fun out to the Paul Newman laugh is legendary for that reason. Robbins in this movie is a bird to right to be caged, but he does it in a very different way. And obviously it's evidenced by the fact that he's still very rooted in the reality of, I don't belong here. And someday I will get out of here. Like that's, that's on his mind and it happens somewhere early on in the movie. So yeah, I don't think he's thinking about it when he's asking for the rock hammer, but I think he's also a lot less in just accepting this is my life forever. I think he's just biding his time kind of. Definitely. Yeah, I think so, too. Uh, And you even have the line that uh, Morgan Freeman says towards the end about, you know, some birds are just too beautiful to be kept caged or or something, something along those, you know, something along those lines. But yeah, I'm glad you brought up Cool Hand Luke, because I mean, there's definitely, you know, religious undertones here, just, you know, biblical undertones here with the whole messianic uh, figure, um, you know, with that Andy Dufresne might be similar to Luke and Cool Hand Luke. Um, You know, they're people who are there to kind of say like you know we don't have to accept this we can you know we can set you free you know right, in, right. so to speak you know so it's uh yeah it's a definitely an interesting you know comparison there you know i mean obviously like you said cool and luke kind of ends a little more grimly whereas this has more of a happy ending but has more of a darker midsection whereas you know cool and luke i guess you could say is more light in the midsection but uh i mean that stuff at the end again i know we're just jumping all over with movies because i just kind of i just re i just rewatched it kind of recently and newman's my favorite actor of all time so like i really you know i was watching it again i just it's in high school and all that stuff at the end with george kennedy like when they run away and then they're and and he gets shot and and then kennedy you know hits the guy with the glasses and as they're driving away and he's you know yelling after him you're like you old uh, luke you know like we're gonna be somebody it's just so sad it's he's gonna go back to prison and and luke's gonna die and and this sad florida like i'm sorry to spoil it anyone hasn't watched the movie but that it's such a good movie and and newman is so fucking good in that movie that's like it's top, top, top shelf Paul Newman. Oh, hundred percent. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, well, you mean you've got the comparison, you know, when Andy breaks out and when you know Paul Newman is, you know, laying on the table after he ate his eggs, he's kind of like yeah. the you know crucifix, you know. And when Andy escapes, he's kind of you know looking right. up at the camera, you know, like ah, uh, you know, freedom, like salvation. Um, so yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's great to compare those. We did that on the show on Blockbuster Mentality. Check it out if you haven't. Um, <laughs> uh, I love 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 the um, when they end up tarring the roof um and they actually volunteer um to do it um yeah i've seen this uh, movie a bunch of times a lot of it in bits and pieces because again i've seen it on tnt here and there but i always forget that that they volunteered to do that because you know may's a great time you know may's a great month to be outside um For some reason, Morgan Freeman's now a Southerner, you know, Southern Baptist. You know, he's a, yeah. You're doing he good. Talks you're doing like real good. this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so yeah, they volunteer basically, and you know, Andy kind of overhears Clancy Brown talking about, you know, my brother died and left me this money, but you know, half of it's gonna go to the IRS. It's gonna go to the government. Um, and uh, so he overhears it, and he kind of goes over to them, and you know, uh, Clancy. He's like, nah, you're not, you're not coming over here. Like, 
first of all, Andy, why are you saying, do you trust your wife? Well, that's, you know? but see, that's why, <laughs> see, that's why when I talk about this movie being such an incredible set of, of, of setups and payoffs, right. That's why I'm talking about how, how good the script is because so Darabont's writing this and he's thinking to himself, like every time I have one of these moments, I need to draw the audience into this moment. I need to make this right. moment really sing. And again, not every single moment in this movie, like some of the stuff with Gil bellows, you know, some of that stuff is probably some of the slowest stuff come a little later in the movie when he shows up and, but it serves a purpose. But, but again, this scene suds on the roof is such an instrumental scene to, into why this movie is so good. And it starts literally yeah. with, we need to see, some evidence of why this bird is too bright because he's got the balls to ask him that question the way that he asks him. And and maybe in real life, nobody would actually ask that way because he knows he could just die. But, you know, it's so uh, exciting when he says it, the line, the way that he says it and right. like the whole sequence of that scene and the way that it, cl- it, it climaxes with them drinking the beers and, 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 you know, William Sadler walks over, you know, you want one Andy and it, there's just, and he's got the smile it's just amazing. Like that scene is the best scene in the whole movie. I think probably that and the escape are the two that come to mind. Yeah. Really. Maybe Brooks was here being the other one, but like those, those are the scenes that really stand out. And I think the suds on the roof scene, when I think about this movie, you could, you can tell most of the story of what's great about this movie in that scene. You get almost the whole thing right there. Definitely. Yeah. It's, it's so great. Yeah. I mean, he's, you know, basically, yeah. <laughs> do, do you trust your wife? Um, it's like, yeah, that's not the guy you want to you want to be asking that to. But, uh, but yeah, no, it, it, it's great because yeah, yeah, eventually, yeah, gets the suds on the roof, the beer, the beers to come for his friends, for the guys that are doing all the work, uh, because he he was a banker and he knows about the IRS and you know what uh, the workarounds and all that. Put it in your wife's name as a gift to her, and you can you know, work around that. And it's just, yeah, so great to see him work outside of, you know, the, the prison walls, you know, what, what he was before, before he came, became a prisoner. Um, and then, yeah, he ends up doing the taxes for everyone and everything. But, uh, but yeah, that's that scene is just it's so great to see, you know, that shot of Tim Robbins just kind of smiling. He doesn't he doesn't even want to be. He said he gave up drinking, gave you up know, because he's yeah. yeah, it's so great. Yeah, because he's, you know, drunk at the beginning of the movie, you know, because he would think he's going to kill his wife or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, he's just he's just happy to see his friends enjoying the beer. And, you know, just uh, yeah, just it's one of the great great scenes in this film and in cinema yeah. in cinema um but uh but yeah so yeah that's that's all great um and then uh but that uh that that doesn't i mean it kind of bodes well for him but at the same time not because that puts him under the warden's radar we haven't talked about the warden yet my God, Bob Gunton. Gunton? Yeah, Bob. Yeah. yeah, Bob Gunton, a guy who you want to talk about certain actors who are defined by a role in their career. And Bob Gunton's in, he's in a bunch of stuff over the yeah. years. I mean, he had a pretty good career and, and you'd, re- you'd recognize him from certain movies. He shows up in The Perfect right. Storm. He's got a role in that's sort of significant. He's in I Heart Huckabees. I remember him in that movie. And anytime I ever see him, I'm always like, this, that's, that's just the ward. That's Ward Norton. There's just no other... There's few there's few actors I can think of that are more defined by a role than Bob Gunn as the warden. And he's yeah. great. You know, I mean, there's a very kind of cartoonish good and evil in this movie that I remember when I was a kid going to my local video store. One of the kids working there. I mean, it's funny because I was probably 15 and he was probably like 21, but he seemed yeah. like grown at the time. <laughs> right. But I remember he was like, everybody loves the Shawshank Redemption, but I think it's like a totally mediocre movie with some really good acting. And like, it's really cartoonish and, and it's, you know, the but not every story has to be so grounded in reality. And there's a bit of a fairy tale story to this where like the evil is really evil. The warden is, has like no redeeming quality. He just is pure evil. You'd like, you never any really get any sense of why he or Hadley are the way they are. And you right. don't really ever, they don't really do a lot to, to develop those characters outside of what you see in the prison. 
Yeah. Which is interesting. You know, you see in, in the green mile, which is just a few years later, and it's another Darabont prison film. You end up seeing more of that stuff. Cause you end up seeing more of the family outside of the prison. I think James Cromwell is who I'm thinking of his yeah. wife. Um, you get a greater sense of these characters outside the prison. Um, but in this movie, you really don't get anything outside the prison. And all you're getting is the version of these characters and exactly how they exist to the prisoners inside the prison. Yeah, definitely. And uh, yeah, and I love that because, yeah, I mean, it's all takes place. We don't see, you know, anyone's family outside the prison or anything like that where you might see in other movies. Like, it's just, no, this is, this is Shawsh. It's called Shawshank Redemption. It's all taking place in Shawshank. Like, that's, or Andy in Shawshank. We're following Andy along, and, you know, this right. is, this is what it's about. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, we did our top villains once on the show a long time ago. And, uh, I don't know why I never thought to put the warden in this, but watching it this time around, I just thought like, is he one of, you know, is he, is he top five great villains of all time? You know, I mean, it's, uh, you, you gotta, you gotta at least put him, you know, in the picture, you gotta at least put him, you know on a short list somewhere. I, I, would I think, think the reason he's not on the list is because the great villains, usually you have some clear understanding of why true. Yeah. Um, you know, and like, like if you think about, I mean, any of the greatest ones, if you think about Vader or if you right. think about like, um, Commodus and gladiators, one of the greatest yeah. villain performances of all time. You think about Commodus, like he's such a hateable, but also totally relatable character. Like you understand why yeah. Commodus is who he is so clearly. And that's why it makes all those moments so powerful. Like at the end of the movie, when he stabs him just before the final fight, like right. just, it's so clear. Whereas like Bob Gunton and, and, you know, uh, Hadley, like they're just evil. They just right. are power hungry evil. And that's that's the sort of good and evil cartoonish nature of the story, which doesn't bother me nowadays. But there was a period of time of like revisionist time in my life going back where I think I felt movies had to have more depth in all parts for me to sort of appreciate them the same way. And I, I've, I've come around on that. Like this movie just it, works. I don't have to overthink it. Right. Exactly. You don't because, yeah, I mean, it's just like these guys are up against these guys like it's it doesn't you don't have to go any deeper than that like why is the warden like this why is the captain this bad no it's just it's it's the prison essentially the prison is your enemy the right. warden and the captain are part of the prison like that's you know that that that's what we're dealing with here that's what that's what andy is fighting um i mean we got to talk about the sisters a little bit uh boggs who is uh who Andy sometimes was able to fight off, sometimes not. You know, yep. I'd, I'd like to tell you he fought him off, but uh, this isn't that kind of story, you know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you get the... the the whole prison experience, you know, the, <laughs> you know, the, the classic, you know, uh, you don't, uh, don't drop the soap type thing, you know, it's, well, yeah, uh, there's also, I mean, again, like the setup of, of, such such a little screen time required to explain yep. who these people are, right? Like, yeah. I don't believe it would matter to them if I told them I wasn't a homosexual. And he says, right. either are they, they'd have to be human first, right? That little yeah. exchange, you just got everything you needed to know about these guys. That was, exactly. that was it. Red just explained it to you in one sentence. Now you know these guys are evil. They're just, like, it's, it's uh, yeah, and, and they're, it's rough, those guys, you know? But then, yeah. obviously, again, the setup, it sets up the payoff which is so satisfying when Hadley just beats the shit out of Boggs. It's yes. such a satisfying, just, he just demolishes him. It's yeah. That's the, one of the, <laughs> one of the, probably the only time you like Hadley is cause he, right. he gets who's after the, the protagonist of the film, exactly. you know? And it's just like, yes, he got his, even, even when, uh, uh, Dufresne says, you know, if you stab me in the, in the brain, you know, my, uh, right the reason you know, my jaw will down. lock yeah you'll need a crowbar to, to lift up so anything you put in my mouth it's uh it ain't going it ain't leaving my mouth once i'm gone so and they they rethink that so good <laughs> good idea but yeah he's never able to walk again so you know there you go <laughs> but uh but yeah i mean that's always you know uh, been a, a famous line i'd like to tell you that you know he fought them yeah. off right. i'd like to tell you that <laughs> um <laughs> It's uh, another, th uh, you know, big theme is institutionalism in this. And we get that with Brooks, uh, sweet old Brooks with uh, with 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 his crow Jake. 
Yeah. Oh, sweet old Brooks. Uh, yeah, the old man inside who doesn't want to leave. He ends up putting a knife to uh, William Sadler's throat. He would, because yeah. if I kill him, they'll let me stay. Because this guy's been here, I think, I uh, I want to say 1908, they said. And at this point, it was like 1950-something. Um, so, yeah, basically, he's been there a long time, his most his life. Um, yeah, well, he's also, you know, there's another great introduction to, to Brooks when he asks if he's going to finish that, the, the maggot that he finds inside yeah. his food, you know, and he and he's, he has that look on his face and he gives it to Jake. It's just another one of those screen, it's just another one of those screenwriting setups where it's like, right. you, and I forget that moment. I honestly forget that moment. And I go back to watch the movie and then it happens. I'm like, Oh, this demented old man. I'm like, Oh yeah, of course. He's just asking for his birth. Like, <laughs> right. Every, every, it gets me every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He grabs it and you almost think like, Oh, he's putting it up to his mouth. Oh no, no, he's not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, and apparently don't worry, folks, the humane society was there and they made sure they fed the, the, uh, the bird, a, a a maggot that died of of natural causes. So don't worry, folks. That's actually wow. a true fact. So there you go. Impressive, they wanted impressive to, stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, that is uh, you know maggots have the right to live too. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, Brooks. Yeah, he turns into this. You know, one of the most likable characters in the film. You know, he's uh, you know an old man. The in charge of the library goes around with the books, and that's how basically Andy gets his rock hammers because Red, you know, gives him the the rock hammer and a pack of cigarettes to deliver it to Andy. And uh, uh, but uh, but yeah, eventually Brooks gets uh, gets released, and he writes that letter which he narrates, and that to me you you kind of alluded to earlier is yeah one of the the best scenes in this movie um one of the most heartbreaking scenes and you know it it has to do with the music has to do with his narration i think but uh but yeah it's just it's so powerful you know him talking about you know uh, even even him talking about you know when he's feeding the birds in the in the park you know i think you know maybe jake would come by and say hello but uh you know i don't think that's gonna happen like even that like it's like oh man poor guy you know, know that's that scene that scene that's a real heartstring scene it always has been i think that's probably the scene where the thomas newman score actually stands out the most that's yeah. the one i've listened to the most times um there's a couple tracks that he's done in his career that are like that he has a great track and road to perdition that's kind of similar um that is amazing but this particular track that he does uh brooks was here and and the reading of that letter it's just yeah, it's a, if, again, if you're a younger viewer, if you're like a first timer, I think that's why I like this movie so much is, you know, I've gotten older and I still appreciate all the things I liked when I was young, but it's a dark enough movie and it's a complex enough movie, but it's just easy enough to grasp that you can watch this when you're like 10 or 12 as one of the first kind of serious darker movies right? really connect to every part. And those scenes are so memorable for that reason. Like the scene, that Brooks scene is such a memorable scene. And I don't think you have to be very old to appreciate it. You get no. pretty fast, you know, like you get pretty quick, quickly, all the stuff about the world one got itself in a great big hurry. And, you know, it's like an old man taking his own life. Like you just understand it. You, they set it up so nicely as the one that happens. You fully understand the moment. I, I think you could be 10 years old and fully understand the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I was, yeah, I was very young when I first saw this, uh, very young as in, yeah, 10, 12, you know, something like that. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it was powerful then. And it's still powerful today. You know, even, you know, you can even picture him, you know, he, he, he even says, you know, how he saw an automobile once when he was younger, but now they're everywhere. Right. You know, it's just right. like, you can, you can kind of picture that. Like you, you're in prison for so long and then you get out and like, there's just cars everywhere and it's just, yeah, it's just crazy. You know how, again, how quickly the world can change around you. Um, right. but, uh, but yeah, great, great stuff there with Brooks. Um, sad stuff, but great, but great movie wise. Um, the uh the you know the the corruption in the in the prison system is obviously very prevalent in this movie you got uh Andy Dufresne laundering money for for the warden um he, he reveals to red he made a fake uh fake person to to kind of launder all the money through which kind of uh gets you know is uh 
he benefits from the end. Uh, spoiler alert, by the way, folks. Um, no, they, <laughs> they, they know, they know. Um, but uh, but you know, it, oh, the, so the corruption that brings me to, to kind of Mickey too. You get Mickey, this young kid who comes into the to the prison, you know, just from theft and everything, and then you find out. You know, after they've made friends with him, after he's trying to get his GED with uh, uh, Andy, and uh, he finds out that, hey, I was in prison with the guy that actually killed your wife. And right. How about Flash. this for? How about this for one scene? The guy explaining how he killed Andy's wife. Like this scene is always just stuck out to me so much. The guy talking oh, yeah. about how he killed Andy's wife and her lover. And the yellow teeth, the Elmo Blatch, yes. uh, the, yeah, the way that he laughs, it's like, yeah, I mean, this is this is another one of those scenes that's always really stood out to me. I think it's the strongest part of the Gil Bellows part is, is when you actually see Elmo telling the story. But yeah, yeah. it's I mean, this is a third act. It's, it's the end of a second act getting into third act turn that they need to set up where this movie's going um, because Andy needs to have a reason. He needs to have a reason to fully commit yep. to making his move, you know. And that's and, and and again they retroactively when they do the cutback later in the movie it all starts to add up and make more sense. But it's really amazing that as this is all happening as the movie's going, you don't see it coming. That's the right. thing that blows my mind every time I watch this movie is that when it happens, you just don't see it coming. You don't think that that's what's about to happen. They don't yeah. set it up. You don't get any sense of it from the movie right up until it happens, and then it just makes perfect sense. It's such a good payoff. Yeah, it's uh yeah, it's it's the warden being the his evil self as uh, you know, as as we would expect, but at the same time, yeah, in that moment you don't think like he's got a sniper that's going to take him down, you know. <laughs> that's going to just Of course it's Hadley, right? Of course it is. Of course, it's got to be, you know. It's got to be uh Mr. Krabs. Clancy Brown. <laughs> Who would have thought? Who would have thought that <laughs> the the guy I feared most as a child would be uh, would be in SpongeBob? But uh, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the powerful stuff there with uh, with Mickey, and that that's actually after the the whole scene where you know after he's writing to uh, the Senate and everything, trying to get his library funded for the prison, and you know he. For some reason, uh, I still to this day am kind of wondering what uh, what's going through his mind, why he decides to do this, but he decides to play the record over the PA system. Um, what uh, I mean, what because he gets you know a two hundred dollar check or whatever, and there's a bunch of mail. And he's told to clean it up. You know what? Uh, what do you think made Andy flip here? What do you, What do you think made him just decide to just play the record and ignore the warden trying to come in? I think you got to figure the reason is because he's at a moment where he's, you know, wanting to be reminded. I think he's like wanting to sort of remind the warden and everyone else that like there are things more important than the institutional system. And one of the things that is most important is I want these prisoners to understand culture and something beautiful. And I have the opportunity to share it. And I don't care what the consequences are because that's more important than your Bible and your cells and your rules. Um, and I also think there's probably a small sense of like, I'm, you know, like you don't own me. This right. some, some of that probably also would be like, yeah, things happen. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty powerful scene, right? Always, always has been. He gets the, yeah, uh, the warden and he just turns the knob up. Yep. Yeah. You think he's going to, he's going to be like, all right, I'll turn it off. But then, nope, I'm just going to sit back, let them take me. Yeah. It's almost like it's his one sense of freedom he has, you know, just like right. kind of like with the suds on the roof, you know, it's just like, all right, a little sense of freedom for a little bit, just for a little while, you know? Um, and that's what, it, that's what it's about when you're, you have no chance, you have no hope, hope, which is something that's a big theme in this movie. Um, right. It's a dangerous and, word uh, around here. As, yeah, as he that'll, that'll get a man killed. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, it's just like, you know, it's just the the little moments. Yeah, I'll take a wee gun hole for that, you know, worth worth it. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> Ugh, sounds, ho- sounds horrible, man. A week in the hole. Oh, God. And then, oh, man. So when Mickey dies, you know, that's after 
Andy goes to the warden and says, yo, Mickey has information. We got to, you know, this this will exonerate me. This will, you know, this will prove my innocence and everything. And the warden calls him obtuse, man. He shouldn't have called yeah. him obtuse. <laughs> you got to watch your language around these wardens, you know. it's uh, You don't say obtuse, you know. It's, uh, yeah, a, a naughty word. Yeah, he calls him obtuse, and yeah, he gets a month, a month in the hole for it. Yeah, crazy, right? Yeah, and not only that, when he comes in and tells him that, uh, you know, or he says, I'm sure you found out Mickey's dead or whatever, uh, and he says, you know, I'm done. I'm done laundering for you. I'm done writing your books or whatever he it says. All, this, this all stops. This is, yeah. Nothing stops. Nothing. <laughs> Dance nothing. around like wild engines. <laughs> yep <laughs> that is oh that's beautiful and yeah it's uh yeah there well, well yeah we'll have a book burning party um and then he so yeah a month in the hole we were talking about a week but then he says giving him a, give him another month to think about it it's like oh my god right two months in that room i don't know if i could go 24 hours in a little a little yeah. confined place like that I, like <laughs> i don't know man that definitely sounds it sounds pretty rough to me uh but again it just the time passes so fast in the movie i mean it seems like a punishment but you don't actually they don't like show us any right. of his like hard time in the hole right like it's not something that you experience when you're watching the movie so it just seems like a part like a story beat yeah you're a prisoner like what's it matter <laughs> you a couple months by yourself in the hole like are you right you go, yeah you go insane by the end of two months probably it, by yourself in the hole. exactly yeah well and that's what i like too i mean yeah i mean it's like they don't torture the viewer you know we get a sense of it but they don't you know try to they they, they want the viewer to still enjoy themselves or frank darabont wants the viewer to enjoy him themselves so you know i'm glad he didn't put us through that as well um but uh but yeah i mean that and then that's when we get the whole speech about uh you know you get bu- you get bu- busy living get bu- or you get busy oh, oh. you know the saying there we yeah, go you get busy get living, busy, living. You get busy dying yeah there you go yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we'd get it, um, you know, because you know he's 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 basically lost hope at that point because you know he's just like I'm I've been fighting the system, you know I tried to fight him and you know it's just like I spent two months in the hole for it, and, you know what's what's it worth? And uh, but uh, but that that's at the same time though, you know he's he says get busy living, get busy dying because he knows if he tries to escape and gets caught he's most likely going to die. You know, I mean, it's, it's kind of inevitable. Um, cause you got red who, um, is worried about him after that whole thing. Uh, and he finds out that William Sadler gave him like six feet of rope. Right. It's like, Ooh, <laughs> I don't think yeah. I got that when I was younger either. Like when I was watching it, like, I don't think I got that. <laughs> like the, I, yeah, I the set up and the concern. Yeah part of the movie i think i agree when i got older and i went back to rewatch it i think that the concern of him killing himself was not something that i remembered as clearly as you know when you get older and you because of what you've just seen with brooks like right a lot more sense um and again you also it also sets it's such a good MacGuffin. it's such a good like red herring that they throw you in that yeah. moment and then you know because obviously like there's like a to- like if you've never seen the movie before you the warden walks in the next morning and he's he's in the cell and he's looking around and you're just like how right right yeah you're like, you're like what you're like how did he do it like how where did he go who snuck right. him out and then it like the rock breaks through and you're just like oh man <laughs> you know it's you're like yes <laughs> yeah so it's definitely excited. a such a hurrah moment you know for such a you know kind of a dark film a lot you know and it's yeah. uh yeah definitely a hurrah moment because yeah you see you know andy the night before grabbed the rope and you know it, you know watching it as an adult now you're like oh damn if you're watching it for the first time it's like he's gonna he's gonna do it he's killing himself right you know, like, that's, right that's what's happening and that's what's red so afraid of that's why you, you know that's the worst night of sleep he's ever had um you know goes into that whole thing and just again just such a beautiful use of narration like it just uh, not only is it morgan freeman's voice you know so iconic but just it's 
such a good use of it. I, I don't know. Maybe it's not a good use. Maybe if it was someone else, like you know, uh, Gilbert Gottfried or something, it would be just be like, mm, this is <laughs> I don't this know, is man. awful. I mean, He's I, he just has. I'm telling you. I don't yeah, know. That's, Freeman's <laughs> just got the most. I, I mean, also it's 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 not just the fact that his voice is perfect for the voiceover, and he was nominated for best right. lead actor for this role. Like, there's a there's a reason. You know, he's he's he was he's amazing in the role. It's it's and it's told through his scenes, but it's also the delivery of the voiceover lines. Like the voiceover lines are perfectly delivered. They have exactly right. the right weight. And you know, when he says that the line, I think you're talking about. He says like, "That was the longest night of my life." Right. Like yeah. when he says, when he gives that line, you're just, you're, you're like, man, what happened? Where, how could right. it, you know, like what's going on with Andy? Yeah. <laughs> what, what is going on with Andy? Yeah. That's what, that's what should, the movie should be called. What, what's going on with Andy? Uh, trouble with Andy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tr- trouble with Andy. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you, like you said, he throws the rock through the poster. We realize, oh, a tunnel's dug. And then I love the flashback. Of him kind of switching out the books, switching out the shoes, because he told them to shine them like they're mirrors. I want, oh, yeah. I want, I want my shoes to be like mirrors. And uh, how, uh, Ben? How how often do you look at a look man's at another shoes? man's shoes? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of the best. It's one of the best lines. <laughs> it, it's it's a funny line because I worked for Nordstrom when I was a lot younger, and I sold suits yeah. and stuff. And uh, that's a line that would get brought up often when you were talking to somebody <laughs> about how they should be buying a nicer pair of shoes for some reason. And yeah. How often do you look at another man's shoes? So you yeah. Guys, <laughs> oh man uh but, but uh but yeah i mean that's uh yeah that's you know again the whole the whole switcheroo thing and i love what he opens the bible it's got the um rock hammer cut out in it right and uh you said uh it even has the note you said uh, uh salvation lies within right and his salvation was that rock hammer digging through it and uh yeah just such a because yeah that's what uh, the warden had said to him earlier on in the film salvation lies within and uh yeah that's uh that was a gotcha moment well it's also great crazy too because sometimes you think about from from a writing perspective you know, andy gets this rock hammer early on in the film they never explain how he's able to have this rock hammer the whole movie without anybody ever finding it or the room getting tossed where is he holding it like where where is his rock hammer right and and they never really explain it. And you just kind of take for granted relatively soon that he's like a celebrity with the guard. So he's able to just sort of have it maybe is what you think. You just got right. You don't ask the question. So when right. it finally happens and you realize that he's had it in this Bible, the very same Bible that when the warden meets him, he like hands him. Um, he like yeah. hands him that Bible. Um, you realize that like that was that was another piece of writing from Darabont that was so smart was to just not explain it when it finally gets revealed you're like oh so uh, cool like of right. course he was able to do this for years and years and years right that's why they would have made, maybe if, if his rock camera was getting like nubbed down seriously over the years and they were seeing the same one they might be like well how you know right yeah exactly yeah it's a it's yeah because they don't ever show him opening the bible like uh the warden exactly. when he's when they you know sack his uh his cell you know he never opens it or anything so um you just see andy sweating bullets probably like oh don't open it don't open it exactly. um but yeah it's it's such a such a good device yeah because i mean the, the celebrity he does have in the prison is oh you get to keep the poster up so i think that's what essentially saves him is they don't see the hole <laughs> and the fact that he has a corner cell i mean that's that's what saved him having a corner cell otherwise right. he'd still be in there and there wouldn't be a movie to talk about because this is based on a true story no i'm just kidding i don't know <laughs> i don't know what it's based on it's uh stephen king no- a short novel apparently um yeah I don't rita, know. rita hayworth and the shawshank redemption it's a, it's a yep. short stephen king and i think stephen king has gone on record as saying this is his is it this one is his favorite I believe so. Yeah, yeah. I think I read that earlier. Yeah, it's his. Yeah, it's his favorite film oh, the adaptation. I yeah. think this and Stand by Me maybe are the two that he likes. I want to yeah. say because I know he dislikes The Shining. Um, there are right. a bunch I think he doesn't like. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's crazy too that Darabont ended up not really. He didn't really ever end up having much more of a career of note in the same way that this movie was. You know, he ends up doing The Mist, he ends up doing The Green Mile, and he ends up doing The Majestic, and then he is the producer and creator of the television show The Walking Dead before it transitioned over to the new creators. But nobody right. saw The Majestic. Nobody cares yeah. about The Mist, really. I mean, it's an above-average horror movie 
and and people like the Green Mile. Like people do really like that movie, but the Green Mile is just the hour longer than this, like not as good version. It's right. just a different story that's like I, I don't find watching the Green Mile to be like particularly engaging nowadays. I think it's just a, I think it's a totally good movie, but you know, it's nothing like this. It's a worse version of Shawshank with a little bit of magic. Yeah. In it, you know, a little bit of sci fi in it, if you will. You know, right. that's and that's yeah, essentially what it's all about. But yeah, it's crazy how yeah, he didn't really do much after this. Yeah, I mean he, you know, that I think he was the showrunner like the first season of Walking Dead, maybe, but uh I met him uh, back in like two thousand five when he was pitching the Walking Dead. Um, really? Yeah, I was seventeen years old. I was working at Meltdown Comics and um now now closed, but uh Meltdown Comics was in Hollywood. It was this really cool like industry comic book store. I was going to the uh, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And um, he came in this one night. I didn't know who he was. And he was buying The Walking Dead Volume 1 and Volume 2, uh, the trade paperbacks. And we had a, like an art gallery in the back that we had events every weekend. Um, and he was like, you know, buying these comics. And I was like, oh, these are great. And he was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm actually pitching these tomorrow uh, to, to get this. I'm trying to make this into a show. I was like, oh, that's so cool, man. I was like, that's awesome. I love this comic book. Because at the time <laughs> it was just a comic book. And right. I was like, I was like, well, we have an event going on in the back tonight um, with an art gallery and there's like, you know, drinks and stuff, you know, grab a drink, hang out. And he was like, I'd love to, but I got to buy a pretty girl a pizza. And I was like, <laughs> oh, cool. And then he left. And then oh, the, guy, the, the boss, my boss was like, you know, that was, and I was like, he's like, oh, it was, it was Frank Darabont. And I was like, no way. And then of course the show got made and, and he was the guy making it. So I've always, yeah. Heard. That's oh man, that's awesome. Yeah, I was gonna, I was about to ask, like, did you know that was him? But obviously not. Yeah, that's uh, you could have, you could have uh, <laughs> geeked out on Shawshank on him, like he's never gotten that before. I'm sure. Uh, yeah, but uh, I've heard <laughs> my crazy. one other good story about this movie, and and it's my friend Drew McQueenie, who's you know longtime writer in in LA, and um, he, he's, I mean, he's a screenwriter, but he's also like reviews movies. He's been in the business forever, and. He was working at a video store. I think it was Vidiots. I think it, it was either Vidiots or a different video store in LA, but it was in like 1992 or three or whatever. And Darabont was like a customer of theirs who would come in and he hadn't sold anything yet, but he uh, wrote the script for Shawshank and he came in and he told Drew McQueenie and my other, his friend about it. He was like, yeah, I just finished the script. And he was like, you guys want to check it out? And they were like, sure. And he gave him the script and Drew was like, we had the one copy and like me and my roommate or his coworker or whatever, like went home. We like, we like read it, like passing, I would finish a page. I pass it to him. And he was like, we read it like front to back. And we were yeah. so excited when we saw Frank, like the next day at the store, <laughs> he was, you know, he was like, it was just like, we knew it was great. We like, knew this was going to be a great, great, great fucking movie. Um, right. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty cool. To, that's to awesome. Thing was getting made. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's insane. Oh man. But uh, yeah, I don't even know what he's he's doing now. I, it, he's probably you know just uh, taking in that uh, uh, residual check from Shawshank when it airs on TV. You know. Yeah. Just right. Li- living probably, his best I would life. think. I would think Frank's probably in his late seventies now. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely up there. That's for sure. Um, but uh but yeah I mean, oh, he's uh, only he's only 62 huh wow he's really than i thought so what 30 years uh he was only so he was in his 30s when this came out that's insane yeah i wow, guess so yeah, th- 30 35 ish 34 yeah that's insane wow well there you go frank we thought you were younger than uh or you thought you were older than you are so congratulations there um <laughs> uh and then uh you know just to wrap up the movie here you get red who finally gets out after this is the third parole hearing we see in the movie and another great scene i love is you know just him just like I don't care anymore. You know, what does rehabilitation mean? Yeah, you know, right. It's just a made up word for people in suits like you, you know, that, can, that whole thing. You know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That whole thing. Exactly. <laughs> but it's so great. It's so powerful. You got the, and I love the shot of it. And this was actually, this was shot by Roger Deakins. I don't know if we mentioned that yet, but yeah, amazing cinematographer. And um, it's, uh, yeah, just such a great scene, you know, because it's like, you know, I was a dumb kid and, because earlier he's like all saying like oh I'm re- I'm rehabilitated like he's like almost too enthusiastic and just unbelievable yeah, right. at this point he's just like I'm just going to tell them the truth and spill my heart out like right I have no I have no hope you know I have no hope but uh he gets approved he gets approved for the 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 parole and uh he goes and does the whole thing that Brooks did 
which uh, you know ends up in the halfway house, same halfway house that uh, Brooks uh, lived and and died, um, and looks like same grocery store. Ask if, asks if he can take a piss, and uh, he doesn't have to ask that anymore. You don't have to ask yeah. if you can take a piss. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, it's 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 you know, and then essentially yeah, blah blah blah. He finds Andy happily ever after the end. You know, that's uh, that's essentially the movie. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's just it's so great. You know, it's about redemption. It's about hope. It's about you know just. Uh, uh, you know, taking action, you know, I think giz- get busy living or get busy dying. That's essentially the, the epitome of this movie is, uh, you gotta, you gotta take action, you know, whether you're so, going to stay in prison, you, you yeah. gotta decide what you're going to do here, make the best of it or get busy doing something else. <laughs> Let me ask you of, of the five best picture nominees that year. Cause it's one of the most, it's one of the most legendary stacked Oscar years ever. Right. So you've got, you have Shawshank Redemption, which was nominated for best picture. You have Pulp Fiction. You have Forrest Gump, which ultimately won best picture that year. You have quiz show, which in another year would have been like a really great movie, but it's not considered yeah. to be great. And then you have four weddings and a funeral is the last one, which is like the odd man out movie. Cause like nobody cares about that movie now. So if you're ranking those five movies personally, you're in terms of enjoy personal enjoyment, what's your ranking? Uh so because the forest ended up winning, right? Forest won, yep. Yep. Um, I would go Four Weddings and a Funeral, five, Quiz Show Four. Um, oh Forest Go, no, I don't know. For uh, Forest Gump, probably three. Yeah. Pulp Fiction two this one probably i think that's my exact ranking probably it's the same yeah it's, it's probably uh, the same ranking yeah it's possible yeah, that I, th- I i can't i can't say quiz show is better than forrest gump it's just I right think it's great like you know yeah that's the thing yeah like you said like any other year like it's like yeah yeah probably you know um like especially if it came out two years later the english patient one like yeah i think it you know it could it could have it could have beat that out and looks like fargo jerry Maguire, secrets and lies and shine like yeah it's uh yeah it's yeah shawshank i mean it didn't get um like people i think confuse it sometimes it, it, it flopped in the box office but critics loved it like well and then it had and, a second it had a second life it got re-released closer right. to oscars time so it ended up doing better yeah it's it's interesting when you go you go back to look at best picture and best performance nominees over the years which i've done quite a bit of obviously because of schmodown and you yeah. <laughs> uh you realize that there are movies that come out that were nominated for like seven oscars including best picture that you have just never heard of and then they have actors that you know you like they have actors you recognize right. yeah. like and at the time this movie probably really mattered but it just didn't live on there's a film nominated i think i can't remember the exact year it's it's maybe like 82 or 83 it's called the dresser uh-huh um that i just I, the other day i looked it up and it's like it was nominated for like seven oscars including best picture and i think like that's best a- actor as well yeah, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, the, the dresser that's the year 1983 Terms of Endearment won that year. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think I've ever heard Albert Finney's in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a huge it's like a huge cast and it's yeah. like it's all the all this uh, like, you know, commendation, but that's just that's the way it works. Like when, when if a movie doesn't take hold culturally in a way that people want to relive it and, and discuss it and continue to like review it, that's where like the retrospective Oscars if you were to go back and do it again, that's where you like really learn that like some movies, you know, like how did, for instance, fight club in 1999, not get nominated for best picture when you right. consider like the movies in 1999, like would you, do you, in your mind, what is the more notable movie fight club or the cider house rules? No, right? Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent fight club. I just think, I think nowadays if fight club came out, like I think it would be nominated, but I just think back then they were just more about just the serious dramas. We don't nominate kind of, almost comedies almost action movies you know yeah I, that's what i think it was about more so than it being the better movie i mean obviously it was better than cider house rules you um, go back to 2007 and you think about the fact that zodiac didn't get a single oscar nomination like right we look back at zodiac now as arguably david fincher's best movie in a lot of people's minds a lot of people are convinced that's his best movie and like there will be bloods incredible and Michael Clayton is one of my favorite movies of all time. So those definitely both belonged and, and deserved Oscar nominations, but like I'd have to pull up the list, but like, I think like La Vie and Rose might've gotten a nomination that year. Like there was, 
you know, there's just Juno. Yeah, atonement. Juno, Atonement. Yeah, yeah. Those, were the, those were the movies. That's, uh, that was also two years before the expansion, where five pictures. Right. Still- yeah, yeah. Now, yeah, now I feel like Best Picture is not as special because there is so many uh, nominees. Uh, you know, it's just like I mean, it's it's great to be nominated for Best Picture, but at the same time, like when it was just the five, like I don't know, it just seemed like more. You right. know, these these are the five, you know, and For now sure. it can be, you know, but I don't know. Um, it it's just it just it, this year I don't know it just it especially well, yeah. weird just cause, now yeah now we're dealing yeah. with this year is totally like <laughs> uh, nobody knows what to make of this year. I mean, yeah, I know <laughs> it's the weirdest years, uh, weirdest year in a long time that's for sure. But uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's Shawshank Redemption. I know uh, you know I, I kept you longer than I said I would, but uh, oh, good, I appreciate <laughs> you you powering through it. Uh, any last thoughts on the film that uh, we? didn't get to no i mean i just think this is just it's just one of the great it's one of the great american movies and it's really endured culturally in a way that i think just so many other movies don't i mean even even to some degree even like forrest gump which won best picture and is such an iconic movie and people love forrest gump i still think is discussed and watched way less than this movie um yeah. you know i just think i just think that there are certain movies that capture something really specific in a really great way and uh and live on and this is one of those that just just does it you know again i think i think about certain movies too that I feel like get, ended up getting overshadowed. I think about the Wolf of Wall Street and like yeah. how it was nominated for a bunch of stuff, but that ultimately 2013 ended up being about 12 Years a Slave and Dallas Buyers Club and these other movies at the Oscars. But when we look back in 10 years, no one's going to want to talk about 12 Years a Slave. People right. probably won't really care to talk about Dallas Buyers Club. They probably, I mean, like, some of the other 2013 movies that are good, like there are definitely some good ones in there, but like, you know, gravity, like th- right. I think, th- I think the truth is when we look back at 2013, most people are going to want to just like watch Wolf of Wall Street and quote it and laugh about it. And it's, it's going to take on more and more of this reputation and size of, because people like watching it. If, you, exactly. if people Let's... love to watch a movie, that's how it lives on. It's ultimately why the people that argue against the MCU films uh, impact culturally are so wrong. Like, Infinity War is a beloved movie. It is populist entertainment that people love. It's right. iconic. It will go down as iconic in the same way that Empire Strikes Back is iconic. Like, yeah, because people it's, love it. It'll be that way in twenty five years. I promise. Yeah, you. and and that's why. Yeah, people shouldn't be you know down on a movie because. Oh, it, First of all, if it wasn't nominated for Best Picture or if it didn't win Best Picture, because look at Shawshank, nominated for seven, didn't win any Oscars, and yet it's number one on IMDb. It's, uh, you know, it, it's in most people's top 10 movies of all time. Um, and yeah, it's just, you, you can't just go by the Oscars. Uh, so yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, looking at 2015 right now, spotlight one, like who's going to watch spotlight over Mad Max Fury road, you know, like who's, or even the big short. I mean, I, I'm big shorts more entertaining than spotlight spotlight. Yes. Fine movie. Uh, you know, I love, I, I love all those movies. I find, I find yeah. and the Martian that, that 2015, yeah. That's a good year. That's a good year. Yeah. There's a lot of good movies in there. Good year, but you know, it's it's like, wh- how are you going to say? Oh, Spotlight's the best. You know, it's a, it's all subjective. You know, right. it's that's what right. it all comes down to. You know, it's it's you know, it it is what it is. If your film doesn't win, it doesn't make it any less great to you, folks. That's what correct it's all if about. I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong. Carol came out that year as well. Uh, 2015, I believe so. I, she, uh, she, uh, it didn't, uh, get nominated for best picture, but I believe it was nominated for, uh, yes, best. Carol is 2015. And that's yeah. of all the movies we just named. Carol's my favorite. Carol's the really, it's, that's, I mean, yeah. I, that's an incredible year of movies. Like I like all of those movies and I love, yeah. I, I would watch, but Carol is like the one from that year that has stuck with me the most. Um, yeah, that's 2015 is a great year for movies. Yeah, no, I love 2015, 2016, I think are definitely up there for me. But uh, all right, Ben Bateman, where uh, where can people find you? Where when does the album come out? What tell us what's what's going on? You guys can find me at Ben Bateman Media on Twitter and on Instagram. Um, I also am in the movie trivia showdown. I'm in a, the middle of a big 
big season eight run, trying to get that singles title and that team's title back uh, and doing that, you know, having a lot of fun with that. Uh, my music is, I share it all over my social. And, and again, guys, it would mean so much to me if you checked it out and left a comment on the YouTube lyric video for Sorry for Tonight. The album will come out probably in July and I'll be touring all over the US, New York, Chicago, Atlanta, Orlando, San Francisco, Seattle, Nashville, Austin, all over in, uh, in August. So uh, yeah, if you like the music, follow and, and I'll keep you updated on what I'm doing. But otherwise, thanks for having me on, man. This was really fun. It's great to talk about a great movie. Um, you know, I hope I didn't talk too much, but I, I do love this movie. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to get to talk about this with you. Well, there you have it, folks. That was my conversation with Ben Bateman, Shawshank Redemption. If you don't like that movie, I don't know what to tell you. You, you, you need to try again. Try again. All right. Uh, follow us on Twitter at BlockbusterCast. Follow us on Instagram at Blockbuster Mentality. That's where you'll get all the show updates. And, you know, rate and review us on iTunes, please. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, but that is it for me. For Ben, I'm Ben. And as always, grab some popcorn, grab some snacks. We'll catch you guys at the movies. Not unexpectedly, I get your letter.